Hey guys, uh, this is the first episode of the Life Taco podcast. I have Senator Richard Ojeda here with me. Um, he is a retired U.S. Mil uh, Army major. Uh, on Tattooed on his back, he's a badass. Tattooed on his back are the names of uh, the soldiers in the war with him that didn't come home. Um, he is a former senator of West Virginia, uh, the 7th District. He is, and he is a 2020 presidential candidate. Um, hi, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I just got to say, you know, you know, my last name is actually pronounced Ojeda. So, okay. uh, you know, is this, uh, you know, this has to be something with the, uh, the live taco podcast. My family's, my family's from Mexico. So <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> no pun intended, I guess. Yeah. Huh, that, I, did, I didn't know that. Literally, everybody says Ojeda on, on TV. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's, you know, my my uh, my family Americanized the name when they come to America uh, and went, found themselves in Logan, West Virginia, where, you know, a lot of people really didn't understand the whole J thing, you know. So uh, so they just went ahead and said Ojeda instead of Ojeda. And, and it basically just Americanized it. So it was all good. Huh. Well, that's cool. We um, Ojeda when we were down in Mexico and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, I was. Uh, what inspired your uh, your start in a life of service, military, political? Like, uh, what kind of got you going? Well, you know, when I was younger, I, I come from a family that had a lot of people that served in the military. My father served in the military. He was in the Air Force and the Army. My uncles were all paratroopers. So, you know, for me, growing up. Uh, you know, I, I was kind of a knucklehead. I was always fighting all the time and things like that. So when I graduated from from high school, I didn't really have much opportunities. So I started working in a bingo parlor that was actually being ran by a veterans organization. And I found myself constantly around these guys. And I just really just I enjoyed the stories that they told and the things, you know, they were they were some of them that were the paratroopers. And it was just like pretty awesome. So one day I made the decision and I said, I'm going to go sign up for the military. And uh, everybody said, no, you're too small because I was very, very small. I graduated high school at 82 pounds. Uh, a lot of people don't think that's true, but I wrestled. So I always knew the weights. I was just a very small person. So I tried to go to the Marine Corps and I went to the Marine Corps. I went and took the tests and everything like that. And then they told me that I was 11 pounds underweight. Now I was past 82 pounds. At the time, I was about 101 pounds because I had started working for the bingo party and stuff like that. And, and I started putting on a little bit of weight. So I was devastated when I come home. So I, I did everything out of my power and I finally gained it to 112 pounds. And I went back to the Marine office and the door was locked. And the Army office across the hallway was wide open. The guy said, come on in have a seat, and, and we can wait on these guys. Well, as I sat down, he started talking to me and he started talking about jumping out of airplanes. And I was like, wait, my uncles all did that. So bam, next thing you know, I'm, I'm on my way to the army. <laughs> and that was it. How did your political career start? Uh, I retired from the United States military. <laughs> and, I yeah. come home. and when I come home, I started looking around and, you know, I know what real leadership is because I had served under real leadership for 24 years in the military. And, you know, I, I saw leaders that led from the front. I saw leaders that had values that would never lie, would, would, would put themselves in harm's way to show you that they were willing to carry the same burdens as you in combat. And I found myself here in Logan County, West Virginia. And I'm looking around and I'm like, that guy's a crook and that woman's a crook. And those guys over there are a bunch of crooks and every one of them are elected officials and they're not doing anything for the people. All they're doing is running around here, acting like they're untouchable. They are, they're above the law. They run this place with an iron fist. And I basically said, you know what? I'll take you sons of bitches on. And I did. And it almost cost me my life. But you know, two days before I won my state Senate seat, I was struck in the back of the head with a pipe rolled over unconscious and then had eight broken bones in my face with brass knuckles. They knew that if I didn't die on that creek bank, I'd be the next state senator. And I'm just a hard son of a bitch to kill. So I won. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, the Republican Party has become pretty ridiculous lately. The Republican Party are shooting themselves in the foot 
every day. But unfortunately, it depends on where you are in the country. I live in the reddest district in the country. And I told people, you could take a pile of dog shit and wrap it up in a Trump napkin. And these people around here would vote for it. <laughs> I saw that tweet. <laughs> and, it, and, I, and I still approve that message. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I was telling a co coworker about you because I, I was telling her about the I was starting the podcast and uh, I showed her some of your videos and she's like, "Well, hell, I would vote for him." <laughs> she, I think she's she's more conservative than she is liberal. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I speak the truth. I mean, look, I'll call Democrats out too for being jacked up. I don't think we should have lifetime politicians in this country. I think that every lobbyist should be made to wear a body camera so that we would get to see the conversations that went on behind the scenes in the Capitol so that our elected officials would be least, less likely to sell us down the river because they know they're being watched. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I don't have a problem calling people out. My first person that I challenged was a Democrat member of Congress that had been in Congress for 38 years. And I ran against him because point blank, he would show up down here in Logan County, West Virginia, three days before the election. He would write three checks to the three biggest crooks in the county and he would disappear. And then it was their job to make sure that he got elected. And he always did. But, uh, you know, I lost. But make no mistake about it, I beat his ass in my hometown. I beat him by 2,700 votes in my hometown. And that's what really started the anger with all these political folks in my hometown because they were used to getting the big checks from this guy. And now he was absolutely lighting them up because he got beat by 2,700 votes. And that's when I made the decision to pick off the next crook in the line. And that's who I beat for Senate. And that was from 2016 until 2019? 2016. I, I, I went on the 2019 legislative session for just three days. I went there to go ahead and, and give my letter, my resignation. I stood up and I, and I gave a speech to resigning. And the reason why is because I was running for president. And my thoughts were, was that it is absolutely unacceptable for me to maintain my seat in the Capitol and draw a paycheck from it if I'm not going to be there. Most people don't care. Most people run for other office and they leave their seat empty while they get that free money. I don't think that's right. I don't think, I think if you're not there in that seat, you shouldn't get paid. Yeah. Uh, what are some things you accomplished while you were Senator and what are some things you wished you did accomplish, but weren't able to? Well, you know, uh, I made West Virginia the first, the, the 29th state, to become legal for medical cannabis. And they told me that it would never happen. And it was one hell of a fight. You know, nobody wanted to support me, but what I did was, you know, if you elect somebody, their responsibility is to go to Washington DC or go to your state capital and fight for you. And my thoughts were, was that we have 22 veterans committing suicide every day in this country that absolutely cannabis can help. Uh, we have people that are sick. We, you show me a police officer and a firefighter that's done that job for 10 years. And I'm going to show you somebody that has a hard time falling asleep at night. So I fought. And in the end, I got the people behind me and they had to pass my bill. So in my first legislative session, which normally takes people three or four se uh, sessions before they get anything passed, I got the most controversial bill in the past 75 years passed in West Virginia in my first session. The next Next session, well, also in the first session, uh, because I raised a lot of hell, they they went ahead and gave the correctional officers in West Virginia a pay raise. And then they put me on the committee over the uh, correctional uh, officers, uh, correctional facilities. So the very next year, I was able to get them a second pay raise. And it was my speech in my second legislative session that started the teacher strike that spread across the country. So, you know, I made a lot of noise when I was there and I gave a lot of speeches. I think that if you elect somebody to an, to an office and you don't see them standing up fighting on local news channels every night, then they're not doing their job. And I did my job. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of things that I wish I could have done. Uh, but we were in the minority. You know, I would have loved to have been able to overturn, uh, uh, you know, the right to work. You know, we sh you look at a, every state in America that's a right to work state is also the poorest. It has the worst uh, safety on the job. It is just hold on for a second. Hold on for a second, please. Please. 
Major Ojeda speaking. Well, thank you very much. Uh, believe it or not, I'm actually on a live podcast, but that's okay. I won't mention your name. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. You're the best. Love you. <laughs> bye bye. Awesome. <laughs> I've been doing fundraising for uh, Georgia. You know, right now, know. one of the things that we're working on is we are trying to put boots on the ground in Georgia. We need to flip those two Senate seats to the blue so we can give President elect Joe Biden a Senate that he can work with. Uh, we're also basically identifying all the voters in Georgia to make sure that they are registered to vote if they've been purged from the rolls, because that's taken place. Uh, and also we're working with an organization to provide uh, rides to the polls on January the 5th for that runoff. So, you know, for folks that are watching this on here, if you go to uh, no dim left behind.com support us because we are absolutely doing the good work that needs to be done. We're working with humanity Ford and Andrew Yang to do these, uh, these capabilities. We need to flip the Senate blue. If for no other reason than to tell Mitch McConnell to take his raggedy ass to the back of the room because he's no longer the Senate president. That right there alone is worth it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Trump's already admitted that if more people vote, the Republicans lose. <laughs> exactly. And and he's saying right now, he's saying that now, unless Joe Biden can prove that the 80 million votes are 100% are legit, he's not giving up his seat. Bullshit. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you think for one second that the generals and the admirals, that the FBI, that the CIA, that the Secret Service don't already know who their next boss is, they're not going to lose their livelihood basically holding on to this orange turd. It's just the way that it is. It's over with. Donald Trump can beat his chest all he wants, and he can go ahead and continue having those private militias out there that are a bunch of toothless inbred people that want to act tough. But once again, everybody wants to be gangster until it's time to do gangster shit. These people right here, they know better. Donald Trump will be drug out of that damn office on January the 20th. And I hope it's I hope that's what they do. Don't let him walk. Drag his ass out. I want to see his. I want to see his fingernail prints in the friggin' marble floor. That's what I want to see. Yeah, I. If he had just conceded and just like been, you know, whatever, like that wouldn't have been as fun. That wouldn't have been as fun as what's been happening. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 but, but you can't expect Donald Trump to be presidential. He hasn't been presidential since the day he took office. And oh, by the way, now that we are starting to see his schedule. I did a live video the other night and I spoke about it. I spoke about how 290 in the, just over the course of three months, three months, 297 hours was executive time. Executive time for Donald Trump is TV tweet time. 297, 80 some hours was traveling. Uh, another 30 some hours was events. I mean, literally when it broke down, the guy does nothing but sleep watch TV and friggin' tweet and golf and golf. And golf. <laughs> well, he, I remember that he offered John Kasich the VP spot and John Kasich turned it down, but he said that he was, it was John, uh, it was um, Donald Trump's son that offered it to him. And Donald Trump's son told him that he would be in charge of foreign and domestic affairs. And John Kasich said, then what would he what be was the president going to do? And he said, making America great again. Yeah, they want, that's it. They wanted somebody, but that's how it is. That's what's going on right now. Donald Trump is not doing any work because we are seeing now in his, in his basic, his schedule shows the dude sits in a freaking room, you know, probably in freaking dirty underwear that's got Cheeto puff freaking dust all over it. And he just sits there and tweets and then rages, uh, you know, at, at the news channels because they're not kissing his ass. <laughs> Hey, it is what it is. I don't give a shit. Yeah, we need to get in the debates. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen you and Trump in the debates. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I'd like to. I'd like to go head to head with with uh, with Don Jr. and Eric Trump. I like, that's who I like to go head to head with. Yeah. So, um, speaking of uh, president, uh, your presidential run, did um, what was some of the things? What would be some of the things now? Looking at the current landscape. Obviously, coronavirus is a big deal. What are some other things that you'd be interested in uh, 
working on and how would you go about uh, fixing some of the big problems that we have going on? Well, obviously, you know, veterans is a big thing of mine. You know, I spent 24 years in the military, 22 veterans committing suicide every single day. What I would like to do is be able to, and I'm probably going to do this. I'm probably going to figure out how I can walk the halls of Congress periodically to speak to them about allowing the Veterans Administration to be able to administer cannabis, a non-addictive form of pain management to veterans that are struggling. You know, I, I did a live video, not a live video, but I gave a speech when I was in uh, the state Senate and I held 13 dog tags up in my hand. And I said, these, I said, cannabis cannot save these people. We can't bring them back, but the cannabis can help the people that see these people's faces every night they go to sleep. Uh, and that's true. Cannabis absolutely is something that could help to cut down the number of, of veteran suicide. Uh, the truth is, that I would like to see the VA get the ability to override state laws. Because if a state is illegal for cannabis, but we know that cannabis can help veterans that are struggling with PTSD, then let the VA override those state laws and allow the VA to administer cannabis to those veterans. I don't care if it's Marinol Peel or if it's actual leaf itself doesn't matter. Let's give these people the ability to have a non-addictive form of pain management. We now know that it's not the devil's lettuce. We now know that there's enough research done that shows that it helps people with cancer. It gives people an appetite so that they can keep weight on while they're going through chemotherapy. We know that it helps people that are struggling with, with pains, uh, you know, a multiple sclerosis, severe ADHD, Crohn's disease, Parkinson's disease. You know, I mean, and, and once again, I say PTSD, but understand when you hear the word PTSD, you think military. But you also need to think about the battered spouse. You need to think about the children. You know, let me tell you something. There's going to come a day when every single one of those children that have been sitting in cages for the last three years, and some of them who have been sexually assaulted, some of them who have been mistreated, there's going to come a day when cannabis is going to benefit them. Because make no mistake about it, that situation has created PTSD for every single one of those children that have been ripped from their mother's and father's arms and stuck in a friggin' cage. Hmm. Um, that, the last time we talked, you mentioned that you were, I think you said the spokesperson of a CBD company. I was. I was a spokesman for CBDoils.com. I am no longer the spokesman for CBDoils.com. Uh, it's just that that organization, it, it wasn't moving at the speed that I think it should have moved. And right now it's basically, I, I believe it's shut down. So I cut ties with that. I mean, it's nothing against it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I support CBD wholeheartedly, but at the end of the day, I want to make sure that everything that we're doing is going for a good cause. It's not saying that it wasn't, it just wasn't moving at the speed that I wanted to see things move. You know, I, one of the things that, that, it, that enticed me was that we were going to provide veterans with free samples. Where are they at? <laughs> poof, I'm doing something else now. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, when you dropped out of the presidential race, you did that because uh, you were, you didn't, you weren't getting enough media coverage and you felt like you didn't well, need to take people's money if you weren't able to, to get that. Look, yeah, that's, that's one of the main reasons is I got a thousand dollar check from a handicapped woman in San Francisco. And I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. And the reason why is because, you know, I was on morning Joe, I was on Meet the Press. I was on State of the Union. Uh, I was on Van Jones. I, I was on the shows. They never once called me a presidential candidate. They just had a conversation with me. Uh, the only person that said presidential candidate Richard Ojeda was Chuck Todd after I, re I, I, I shut down the race. He said presidential candidate Richard Ojeda has dropped out of the race. That's the first time. First time. Even though I was on his show a couple weeks before that. Uh, and the reason why is because, you know, when you were a child and you were in the first grade and they were teaching you certain things and they said, in America, anyone can grow up and become president. And that's one of the reasons why I threw my hat in the ring. I said, why not? We've always been told that anybody can be president. So I said, screw it. I want to do it. 
And I went around, I, I did the news circuit, but then I realized they didn't want me there. The Democratic Party did not want me there. And the reason why is because the parties in this country make the decision who's going to be their president. And they don't want anybody to come out and go against them, even though people do. And, you know, people like myself, they don't even give me the time of day. And, and, and a, a big part of that is, is because I think even these news agencies have already picked the horse that they want to support, that they think has the opportunity. The truth is, is if you do not have political clout, and if you do not already have a serious war chest, they don't give you no time of day. They don't, they realize that you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. You know, it shouldn't be that you've got to be worth a hundred million dollars before you can throw your hat in the ring. Because the truth is, is these people that are worth a hundred million dollars in most cases aren't worth a shit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, think about it. If I would have made it to that first debate, you, I bet you money if I'd have made it to that first debate, I would have been the one everybody was talking about after that debate. Because I would, let me tell you something, I don't go to debates ready to daggone hug and shake hands. I go to a debate to win the daggone argument. That's what I do. And let me tell you something, I had, I got, I had stuff. There's a lot of people out there, Beto O'Rourke. Everybody thinks he's a grist, thinks it's sliced bread. What did Beto O'Rourke say? that uh, uh, when he was on the presidential debate stage and they said, what's the biggest thing facing America today? What did he say? Climate change. Climate change. That's what he said. Now you tell me this. Do you know that he is the number one person in the house at receiving money from big energy? There's only one person in Washington, D.C. that gets more money than him. And that's Ted Cruz from Big Energy. So you're going to tell me that they get all that money from Big Energy and they're going to fight climate change? No, they're not. They're going to they're going drag their feet and tell everybody, we, we really want to do something with this climate change, but we're just not there yet. They're going to make excuses why they don't do jack shit to deal with climate change. I would have, I would have ate him alive the moment he said, climate change. They would have had to turn my microphone on because I'd have been jumping up on a day, but I want him now. Fact. Don't you tell me that you're going to fight the opioid epidemic that has destroyed my hometown. My area is ground zero for the opioid epidemic. They used my people for lab rats. We got, we got emails where they said, they're eating them up like Doritos, boys. Keep them coming. You guys send them and they're going to take them. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's daggone, uh, uh, what's the daggone, uh, uh, McKesson and those drug companies. They used our people here as lab rats. And let me tell you something. There was a few people up there running for president that can say, we're going to fight this, glo this, this uh, global, uh, this uh, pa uh, not pandemic, but the opioid epidemic. Let me tell you something. I would have come out of my seat on their asses. They, they would have not been happy with me. And I wouldn't have given a shit anyway. Yeah, <laughs> better or works not high on my list. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, he's not. I don't. I don't. I don't give a shit. You know, I'm sick and tired of these people. We're we, we gonna support him because he 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 looks like Kennedy. I'm gonna give a shit. But he but he may look like Kennedy, but he's an ass. Like Obama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't give a shit. He don't do nothing for me. Um, you mentioned your uh, live Facebook live last night. I remember I, I watched a good chunk of that last night. Um, you were talking some about the religious folk. Uh, yeah. At some of the scams that they've been pulling. Yep. And um, I don't know if I mentioned it to you before. I was the director of Christian education at a church that I used to work, uh, work at in Illinois. Um, and I've been so disappointed with the religious people this entire past four years. Okay. <laughs> If you want to feel disappointment, in most cases, join a local church. And look, I hate to say it. I do. I hate to say it. It doesn't mean that I'm I'm a heathen. Make no mistake about it. Whenever I had my static line in hand and I was lined up to exit that aircraft, I was talking to God. 
Whenever I was going outside the wire in Iraq and Afghanistan, I was saying, please, Lord, let us be able to get back on this camp without losing anybody. It is what it is. But I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of these people, especially this, this thing that has come out in the last couple decades, and that's the seed philosophy, where they tell you that the only way for you to get closer to God is you have to plant a bigger seed, which means you have to write a bigger check. And now we're seeing pastors around here. Not only are they driving Mercedes Benz, but their wives are driving Mercedes Benz. We've got pastors on the, uh, on the national scale that are calling for, I want $54 million uh, uh, for a plane, you know, another jet. And I've already got three. Look, you know, I don't, those people right there are full of shit. Ain't none of them worth a dime. And the evangelicals, especially the white evangelicals, have shot themselves in the foot with their coddling of Donald Trump, who absolutely doesn't have a religious bone in his body. Every time they've got their hands on his shoulder praying for him, he's got his eyes wide open usually. And you can tell he's thinking, what a bunch of dumbasses. You know, that's how it is. They don't care. They, they, let me tell you something. These people, all they are doing is trying to put more money in their pocket. That's what they want. And Donald Trump is protecting them because they're his people now. But make no mistake about it. It's time at a minimum, at a minimum, these mega churches and these, these televangelists and these evangelicals that are worth more than so much, it's time for them to start paying their friggin' fair share of taxes. Yeah, I've always thought that because they want, you know, uh, they want marriage. They say like, oh, there, there can't be gay marriage. Like they want to control the religious institutions. Well, well, you know, you know, you got uh, what's his name? Uh, Falwell, who says marriage is between a man and a woman, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman. But I guess it's OK for a man, a woman and a pool boy. That's OK, I guess. That's still godly. If, I mean, you, I mean honestly. if you get tax breaks for being married, then everybody's paying into their taxes. So everybody, I don't, a <laughs> hey, I don't have a problem with anybody in the LGBT. So crazy. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there, there's a meme that I think is great. It says, "Look, if you don't like uh, a homosexual uh, uh, or, or lesbian, gay marriage, then when one of them asks you to marry, tell them no. That's it. Don't worry about it. I don't care if, if these people over here love each other. It doesn't matter. I don't care how you who you choose to love. It don't bother me one bit." I personally think that some of this stuff is absolute garbage where we have now said that transgender are not allowed to serve in the military. If a person wants to serve their country and they can meet the standards, let them join. I don't have a problem with a transgender person serving with, with, with me. That doesn't bother me one bit. Can they carry the weight? Can they do their job? Can they return fire in a combat zone when you get fired upon? It's all I care about. So that's it. And they've, they've been asked backwards, too, on uh, science uh, stem cell research during the Bush era. They, they were against that. Um, COVID. Uh, there were some priests in, I want to say, Mononagua or something like that in some other country recently. Um, he was doing an open casket funeral for somebody that had COVID. All the people in the building weren't wearing masks. And they came up, and it's their ritual to kiss the, uh, the body's hand and face. This guy that was doing the funeral caught COVID and he died. <laughs> I mean, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's like one of those things. You know, are you stupid? We have a global pandemic. We've lost 270,000 Americans. America is the only country in the world that has its head in its ass. Everybody else isn't playing those games. Everybody else is on the front side of this. You know, South Korea has lost like... 487 people. We've lost 270,000. You know, I mean, it's absolute ludicrous. And right now, most countries in the world do not want Americans to come to their country. And that pisses me off because I want to get this virus behind us because I have a 40 day trip planned to Europe. You know, in 2017, I went to Europe for 28 days. I like to travel. And I'm fortunate enough to where I can travel. And I like to go to other countries and enjoy other cultures, eat the food, drink the wine, and have a damn good time wherever I'm at. 
And right now I'm being told that I can't do that, even though I have been researching this trip, planning everything day by day. I've got people that live in other countries that follow me that are waiting for me to arrive so they can meet me at the airport and then they can take me around for a couple of days. You know, I've got that in England. I've got that in Scotland. I've got that in Brussels. I've got it in Berlin. I've got it in Warsaw. Those five places alone, I got people waiting on us. So I want to go. And as long as we got these people that act like it's hurting their, you know, oh, I can't wear this mask. It's, it's, it's I can't breathe. Take your friggin' worthless ass to Iraq and put on the friggin' combat gear that we had in 130 to 150 degree temperature all single day, get inside of a friggin' crowded ass friggin' Humvee that's got all the equipment in it to where you're, you're like this in the corner of it. And, and there's no air conditioner because it didn't happen. We didn't have any of that in those equipment. And you're out there outside the wire all day. If you're a gunner, half of your body is exposed outside the top of the vehicle. And it's like somebody's got uh, blow dryers on full heat in your face. You're not getting, it's not comfortable when you're driving down the road in Iraq and half your body's outside. You feel like someone is shooting you in the face with a blow dryer. It's brutal. There's nothing worse than it. And we could do that shit all day from sunup to sundown. And then we got these other asshats around here. Most of them are these wannabe militia friggin' guys that can't wear a mask because I can't breathe. Big bunch of sissies. And the Supreme Court just recently ruled uh, that in New York that they have to let religious organizations, yep. churches yep. meet however they want to. Yep. Well, well. You know, and let me tell you, this is the reason why we're going to end up having to stack the courts. It's a fact. If they keep doing stupid shit like this, we're going to have to stack the courts to, to, to stop them. And nobody wants to do that. But when you're talking about this, they're going to play religious. You know, they got to understand, first and foremost, People have to eat, eat. You have to, you have to have water. You have to have food. That's how come they said, well, if you can go to Walmart, you can go to church. You know what? How about these pastors not be assholes? How about these pastors care about their people and do things like online sessions instead of requiring? And the reason why they're doing this is because they want that money. That's all it is. Believe me, they could get that money online, but they want that cash in hand is what they want. What's his name? Uh, the one that blew the virus away. Uh, whatever his worthless raggedy ass looks like. But that is, don't you, don't you, tithe, don't you not tithe. You better get that money into the church so he can have him another airplane. The guy owns his own airport. You know, sick and tired of these pieces of trash. And, you know, uh, you mentioned your uh, when you were running for president and how, you know, they've already kind of picked who they want. But then also I was thinking another part of the problem is money in politics, too, and how that affects. Um, I was thinking publicly funded elections. That would help. Yeah. Well, um, you know what? Uh, uh, first off, you got to overturn Citizens United. Corporations are not people. Money is not free speech. Uh, but there's other things that could be done for elections that could benefit everybody and make it to where it's not all about money. And I believe Portland, Oregon did something like this. And what they did was everybody was given the ability to give away $250. Everybody got it. And you had to give it away for you. You couldn't put it in your pocket. You could give however much you wanted to this candidate, but the max was $270. That's it. And what that does is everybody now knows that they have money to spend on races. And that gets people involved in politics because the guy who has never, ever voted, now all of a sudden that elected official knows that that guy got $270. And if he wants that money, he's got to campaign for it. He's got to go knock on those doors. And if they don't, then that person may give it to the other person. So it requires that the politicians are busting their ass to earn that $270 per person. And it also basically says that this is how much money that can be raised in this campaign. And that's it. Nothing else. Why not? You know, it's a shame when you realize 
that I mean, I mean, they spent two hundred million dollars on Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell and lost, lost. They could have took that money and divided it up amongst other candidates all across the country, and we could have took back some of those over a thousand seats that have been lost by the Democrats over the last few years. You know, I don't give two. Sh- you're not. You know, Mitch McConnell has a great argument, even though I think he's a piece of shit and needs held under water until the bubbles stop. Mitch McConnell looks at his people and says, "I'm the Senate president." I'm the highest ranking member of the Senate and I'm from Kentucky. So the people of Kentucky say, if we vote him out, the person who replaces him starts at the bottom. That's how come he has such a great a, a, a hold on the people in Kentucky, even though he don't do very much for them. He's the Senate president. Lindsey Graham says, I'm the chairman of the judiciary committee. Very, very important committee because he's been there that long. So it's hard to dethrone those friggin' assholes. So instead of wasting money on them, let's flip the other seats from red to blue. And then we can send Mitch McConnell to the back of the room because when Mitch McConnell gets beat and gets sent to the back of the room and now he don't have no power at all, people in Kentucky are gonna flush that turd. <laughs> um. Some other ideas. Uh, Bernie Sanders actually ran on him. Election Day being a national holiday. Absolutely. I think over Columbus Day. Columbus was kind of a piece of shit. That's right. <laughs> cancel, cancel Columbus Day and let's make Election Day a day where everybody is off. And, and by law, by law, everybody is off so that everybody has the opportunity to get to the polls and cast their vote. We are a country that allows our people the ability to select their own leaders. Other countries do not get that luxury. So we should do everything in our power to make sure that everybody goes. I would, to me, it wouldn't bother me to even say, uh, you know, like, okay, if you vote, we're going to give you a tax break. I mean, gives it that way. Everybody votes. It's a shame when you realize that, you know, I got 37,000 people that are adults in my hometown. You're lucky if 4,000 people friggin' vote during every election. It's a, it's embarrassing, but people don't give a shit. People don't care. Um, and automatic voter registration. I think that's a big one. Absolutely. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, there, there needs to be a uh, fail safes in there. Like right now in Georgia, they're scrubbing people's names from the rolls. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to pinpoint every single voter in Georgia and then make sure that they're registered so that if they have been removed, get back in there real quick and get registered again, because that's what they're doing. And Oh, by the way, who do you think they're removing from the rolls? Oh, people of color. Go look at the, pri- the, no, 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 no. Yes. The primary election in May of this year, Look at Louis, Louisville, Kentucky. They closed every friggin' polling station in Louisville, Kentucky, in areas of color and made them all rely on one station. At 6.30 at night, they wanted to shut it down. And there were thousands of people outside beating on the windows, still waiting to vote. They had to go to the courts and the courts had to tell them, you're going to stay open till 9.30 now so these people could get through and vote. But it's voter suppression and it still goes on today in the United States of America. There is a bill, H.R. 1, which is sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk, which is a bill that basically says we're going to do away with gerrymandering because every freaking time we do a census and they go to redraw the lines, that's what they do. And it's you look at Jim Jordan in Ohio. Look at his district. They practically drew the map around people's yards that they knew would never vote for him. And I mean, it's crazy. And it happens like all across the country. Gerrymandering is a serious problem. And HR1 will stop it. It will also make people, when they talk about money, it makes them have to disclose the people who are donating. It, it's important. That's important for us to know. Once again, we need to know also about these super PACs and these corporations out there that are going behind the scenes and giving crazy amount of money. There's that's dark money. 
And right now, HR1 is going after dark money too. And we need to. It's a shame when you realize that you could raise a hundred million dollars to beat some friggin' asshole like Lindsey Graham, and he's got double that, and nobody knows where it comes from. It's a shame. You said HR one. Can you kind of what is that? Can you elaborate on that? There, these are these are the bills that are sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. Go to my video last night and watch that because I went. HR1, HR2, HR3. I went through a, a, a probably at least 40 bills I went through last night and let people know what these bills were and that these bills are sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk to die. And every single one of those bills are beneficial bills that will help improve the lives of every single citizen, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, don't give a shit. Everybody will benefit, but they're sitting on his desk to die. He's to do what? What's his motivation for not putting anything because forward? Because he doesn't want to give anybody the ability, especially Democrats, to say they got something passed because he doesn't want them to get any credit for it. He wants them to not get anything done in the hopes that their people are going to vote them out of office because they don't get anything passed. He doesn't want to see the president. He's, if he stays in power, he's going to do that for the first two years of Joe Biden. Everything Joe Biden wants is going to either die or Joe Biden's going to have to do an executive order to get it passed. That's it. And they're going to scream and bitch about executive orders. Like, you know, like Trump didn't do executive orders. That's what they're going to do. That's exactly what they're going to do. And when you look, you listen to my video I did last night, you're going to go, damn, because I gave the details of all these bills. And every one of them, you would go, sounds like a damn good bill. That bill could help people. That bill could help. You know, we got elderly people that dumpster dive. They have to cut their medicine in half. You know, uh, one of the bills is raising the minimum wage. Minimum wage has been sitting at seven twenty-five dollars for over a decade. And oh, by the way, prices have went up. A cheeseburger in McDonald's in 2009 was $2.50. Now it's $4.50. But minimum wage hasn't went up. So when people say, you don't want to raise the minimum wage because it's going to raise the prices of everything. Prices of everything have already raised. We need to bump up in minimum wage so people can try to keep up. And that's what needs to happen. You know, but once again, that's another bill that is sitting on his death to die. But that son of a bitch has voted for him to get a pay raise six times and voted against minimum wage over 15 times. It's a shame. To shame. People need to play, pay attention to politics because these people are damn grifters. And that's what they're doing behind the scenes. So another idea for election reform, and I don't know what you think about these, um, uh, national rank choice voting so that the third parties, you can, you, you can feel free to vote for a third party if you want to. You should be able to. You should be able to. But the problem with that is, you know, number one, if you do that, you've got to figure out how they can get the electoral votes, you know. Uh, but, you know, here's the problem with that, too. This is why the Republicans always stay somewhat stronger, even though the Democrats outnumber the Republicans. Democrats will vote for other, Democrat will vote for, uh, 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 you know, in West Virginia, we have a thing called the West Virginia can't wait. That's the reason why we got Jim Justice for another four years. He's one of the worst damn governors on the face of the earth. He's absolute pure shit as far as I'm concerned. But he won. He won. He ain't done jack shit for four years. He robbed the friggin' road bond money that went on top of the backs of the citizens in West Virginia and ain't done shit for our roads. He's absolute pure trash. And he wins re-election. And he wins re-election because the Democrat that ran against him should have beat him. But you had this group that all of a sudden decided to start their own West Virginia Can't Wait, which is a progressive movement. And they were pushing. What they did was they wanted to get somebody in all 55 counties to run for office. They didn't give a shit if the guy didn't have a damn brain in his head. They don't give a shit as long as he's running. Okay. And that guy who was running was really supposed to be focusing on trying to get the candidate that was running for governor on the West Virginia can't wait group to win the governor's seat. 
So it was, hey, do you know who Stephen Smith is? You need to support him. He's running for governor. He's real smart. And by the way, I'm running for delegate. Could you support me too? That's what they did. And, and, and I'm telling you, it killed our opportunity to beat Jim Justice in West Virginia because half of the damn Democrats supported those West Virginia can't wait guys. And at the end of the day, all of those people, when that guy lost in the primary against Ben Salango, they didn't support Ben Salango, the Democrat, because Ben Salango has signed our pledge that said he has to obey us when he's in office. You see, that's bullshit. I blame the West Virginia can't wait movement on make on giving Jim Justice another four years. Jim Justice is the biggest Trump bootlicker. He ran as a Democrat. As soon as he won, within a month, he switched back to Republican and has been nothing but a damn Donald Trump bootlicker ever since. I think national rank choice voting would help with that too, though, because if they voted for that West Virginia can't wait party and they have no chance of winning, then their vote would go to their second choice, which would more than likely be the Democrat if it's yeah. not a progressive. That's 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 fine. As long as you could keep it like that. As long as the progressives didn't put a person in second and then a person in third. You know, <laughs> I just I, I'm very disgruntled about the West Virginia can't wait movement. I think yeah. they only give a shit about money. Uh, you know, they I mean, it just it just it, I think it's, I think they were garbage. And I think they're the reason why. Uh, uh, Jim Justice got a second term and I don't give a shit what they do or how awesome they think they are. They need not darken my doorstep because I'll push them off my porch. <laughs> so uh, you would never consider then like a third party run or something like that? Nope. <laughs> um, so let's see. Just some random different things. Uh, what do you, Some ideas. Uh, what do you think of Medicare for all? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that's that's that is a must. We need to do that. You know, you shouldn't have to be rich, you know, to, to receive care. You shouldn't have to die because of poverty, you know, and other countries can offer it. We call ourselves the greatest nation on earth, but we can't provide health care for our people. You know, other countries provide free college for their students. We make it to where if you want an education, you have to also agree to be bogged down with student debt for the rest of your friggin' life, you know. I mean, there's so much stuff in this country that we should be doing for our people that we don't. But yet we stand there and scream, we're the greatest. Bullshit. We're far from just because we can kick your ass. Don't mean we're the greatest. There's a lot of other things out there that should be in that uh, equation. Green New Deal. A absolutely. Yeah. I come from West Virginia. Let me tell you something. Coal is dead. Coal mining jobs are ending. And the truth is, is we don't have anything for those coal miners to do other than Walmart and Wendy's. We need new opportunities in West Virginia so that coal miners can transition to jobs that can mirror those wages in terms of pay. And we don't have that. And the bad part about it is, is people in West Virginia don't want Green New Deal because they want coal to continue going on forever. And it's not. Natural gas is overtaken coal. It's just the way that it is. So if you, and, but West Virginia is going to continue holding on to coal. And that's why West Virginia is going to be 50th in everything in the next four years. Uh, what do you think about pulling out of Iraq and Afghanistan? This is more your territory. So. Well, well, look, I want to end these forever wars, but you have to do them properly. Because if you just grab everybody and leave, then you're going to have a power vacuum. You're going to have people getting slaughtered. The people that are our allies are going to find themselves in a world of hurt and probably slaughtered as well. You have to do it responsibly. We need to come up with a deal, even if it's with our enemies, to make sure that the Hazara people in Afghanistan are protected with just the other day uh, where I was at in Afghanistan, the bazaar right down the hill from where I was at had a suicide bomber just the other day killed 17 people. Uh, it's not ending. The, the enemy are still waging war over there, but we have to come with an agreement that says certain things. We'll leave. We'll leave. And you guys can have your country, but you have to do certain things. You know, you've got to not slaughter women anymore. You've got to not go through and kill everybody that wasn't your crew. You've got to not come and slaughter the Hazara people. 
And that's stuff that needs to be done. In Iraq, same thing. Look, we are willing to pull out and we are willing to help you in other ways. But make no mistake about it. If you start acting up, then we reserve the right. I maintain the right to come back and punch you right in your friggin' face. So if Joe Biden did everything right and all the pieces fell into place, do you think he could get that done in two terms? Or, well, he may just have one term. He said he I don't think he's going to do a second term. I mean, he's, he's already the oldest person to ever win the presidency. Yeah. And I think that I think he's already been a vice president for eight years, four yeah. years as a president. I think either Kamala Harris uh, could could take the reins or we could have a primary election and and, and people could could run for that seat as well. Uh, look, you know, I think there's a lot of things that need to be done. There's, it's not going to be perfect. You know, Joe Biden is not the perfect candidate. Joe Biden just happened to be who the machine wanted. And look, I support Joe Biden. I support Kamala Harris. But at the end of the day, were they my first pick? Hell no. I think Bernie Sanders would have been much better. I think Andrew Yang would have been phenomenal. Okay. But once again, at the end of the day, we got Joe Biden. Joe Biden has already said that, you know, he's not for the Green New Deal in the way that AOC is for the Green New Deal. Joe Biden has already said that he's not against fracking. Myself personally, I'm not for fracking. When you have earthquakes happening in Ohio, we've got a problem and that's fracking. But once again, you know, they're trying to get in there and not basically have completely everybody going ballistic on them. This was more along the lines of trying to make sure that certain occupations didn't feel threatened to vote against him and vote for Trump in the race. So now he's going to have to basically follow what he said, and he's not going to stop fracking. But at the end of the day, what does fracking do? Fracking poisons water. Fracking causes earthquakes. You can go to certain places in the United States of America, and you can light your tap water on fire. So if we continue fracking, we just have to be ready to get to the point where one day everything that you do concerning water has to be bottled water. That's it. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure what you think about this one either. I, I don't remember. Um, any I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, undocumented immigrants, how would you handle that? Open borders? A oh. wall? Look, 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 first and foremost, I don't give a shit about your wall. I think we need to have a pathway to citizenship. We need to be able to offer anybody that wants to come to this country a pathway to citizenship. If they come here and we find out that they have a background that is a criminal background, they can ship their ass back to where they are. They're not allowed to be here. But everybody else that is in this country, let's put them on a path towards citizenship. People come to America because they have a dream that they want better. They want to be able to raise their children in an area where they're not worried about the cartel taking their 13 year old and using her as a damn drug mule. Okay. So I have no problems when these people from Guatemala and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Panama and, and Belize and places in Mexico want to come to America. Make no mistake about it. These people work their friggin' asses off. Right now, they are absolutely essential people because they're the ones that are picking the fruit that are making its way to our uh, uh, stores that we're buying while we're all cuddled up in, in our own little caves, you know, for COVID. They're, and they pay taxes on everything that they buy. They pay taxes on everything that they buy. They don't waste their money on alcohol and drugs. They, every daggone time they get a payday, they go to Western Union, which this asshat Donald Trump has already shut down for the people in Cuba. And oh, by the way, the Cuba community supported Donald Trump. And he thanked them by basically saying, you can't use Western Union anymore to send your family money. They just, they just come out. Huh. They just come out. Look, let me tell you something. We are a stronger nation because we are a nation of immigrants. In the military, I had a Puerto Rican young man standing right here next to me. He was my gunner. Behind me, I had a person from St. Thomas, and he was my, my, my navigator. I had people from all, you name it. You know, I, I, I can remember one of, my, one of my troops that I took outside the wire every once in a while on combat operations. He was the he was in the first free bar mitzvah bat mitzvah in Iraq. He was a Jewish soldier, and he was wonderful. And he was highly intelligent, and I believe now I think now he's an officer. You know that gunner that was next to me, 
He's getting ready to pin major. He was an E4. Now he's good. He's getting ready to pin O4 major next month. Very proud of him. You know, phenomenal soldiers, good people. We're a better nation. We're a stronger nation because of immigrants. And every one of us come from immigrants. If your ass ain't daggone from the Navajo nation, from the Sioux nation, you ain't nothing but a damn immigrant as, as well. Yep. Um, so I got down some names to kind of wrap up uh, a word association. <laughs> All right. Mitch McConnell. Asshole. <laughs> I thought you were going to say turtle. <laughs> Uh, Trump. Jackass. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. That one's a little harder. No, no, no. Uh, uh, I'm going to say mummy. <laughs> She's been there far too long. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden. Joe Biden. My president. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he wasn't my first choice either. He wasn't, was mine either. wasn't mine either. Towards the bottom. He's better than Beto and Pete Buttigieg. But, yeah. oh. but I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. He has saved our democracy. Mm -hmm. We would have got another four years of Donald Trump. There wouldn't be a 2024 election. I believe that he would figure out a way for him to be able to not only create his own dictatorship, but to figure out how he can crush the rest of us. He would absolutely crush the Democratic Party. And he, you know, a lot of these people, a lot of these people that, that are, are supporting him, a lot of them are uneducated. And I, I, just, I will say it. There's a lot of people out there. You can see them on TikTok. Some of them are uneducated. Some of them don't have much education. Donald Trump says he loves the, the poorly educated because they're easily duped. And they're duped. They're all following for his for his conspiracy theories. Make no mistake about it. If he would have won and got another four years. By, by the end of those four years, they would hate him, but they wouldn't have a chance to do anything because he would have already set something in place to crush them all. It's a fact. So. There's a rumor that he's considering a 2024 run. Let me tell you something. He is facing over 20 some sexual assault to rape charges. Let me tell you this. He's going to go to court for every one of them. They're going to get a blood sample because some of those are rape cases and they believe a blood sample is going to prove that he was the rapist. OK, so that's a big deal. But every one of those he goes, let's say the, the one at the bottom that says he, he grabbed me by the genitalia and kissed me on my mouth. OK, OK. Now, what does Donald Trump's lawyer have to say? He didn't do it. OK, now here comes the lawyer for the, the person that's accusing him and they push play and it's the video. It's the recording of him on the bus. You know, when you're rich, you can move on him like a bitch. You can grab him by the pussy, right? He did say that. So he just admitted that. So they're going to play that and the, and the judge is going to go, you just said that's what you do. Well, I really didn't mean it. Well, I'm sorry. You said it. You said that you did it. Okay. That's it. And that, and every one of those women are going to win those cases. And then the rape cases. I mean, you may, we may find out that some of those were young girls that were on Epstein Island because that's what that was. That was a billionaire boys club capability to fly to a private Island and do what you want with little girls. And they all did that bullshit. And Donald Trump was on that manifest twice. And so was Bill Clinton. And if Bill Clinton did it, put his freaking ass under the jail too. <laughs> Do you think there's a chance he actually could go to jail with all the power and connections and all that stuff that he yeah, has? Absolutely, he can go to jail. There's a lot of things. I mean, that that the prosecuting attorney in New York has 67 charges against him from tax evasion. Let me tell you something. You got to understand, like 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 Loeffler and Purdue in Georgia, both of them absolutely committed insider trading. If they don't go to a jail. If they don't see the inside of a jail because they're rich, then we have a problem in America. It's time for us to open the friggin' damn jail cells and let everybody out because we cannot allow a double standard in this country. And there is a double standard in this country. Look at the look at the the, the actresses, those two women that got sentenced to prison. And of course, it was only like 60 days. What did they do? They paid a person a lot of money in university UCLA to make sure that their daughters 
jumped the line and got into UCLA. And that right there screwed over two other kids that probably worked their ass off and wanted to go to UCLA. And they never got the chance because why? Because these rich people greased somebody's pocket and they got sentenced to prison. It's a shame that they just got a slap on the wrist and you got to spend 60 days in jail. That's bullshit. They should be doing years in jail for that because an African-American woman who daggone got caught uh, registering her child in a different school zone ended up going to, going to prison over that shit. You know, we can't have a double standard. Donald Trump has broken the law. And when he is no longer the president, he's going to be a felon. And he is going to be basically taken out of the mix. And I hope they go after his children too, because Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump both participated, and I believe Ivanka as well, in daggone robbing a child charity and taking the money for themselves. You know, that's the kind of shit that needs to be exposed and they need to go down for it. Fact. A few more names. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Love him. <laughs> Tulsi. I, 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 was, I was messaging her last night. I think wow. Tulsi is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, she just did. Uh, she, just pushed, she just pushed legislation protecting whistleblowers. And that's what me and her were talking about last night. Tulsi is awesome. <laughs> and she is an actual combat vet. Let me tell you something. You know, I was a combat engineer. We're combat arms, infantry, combat arms, scouts, combat arms, pilots, helicopter pilots are combat arms. They are flying in and out of hot LZs. And when you say hot LZ, that means bullets are flying. She's a warrior. I wonder why some progressive organizations don't really care for her. I know like Anna on TYT and a few other progressives don't really. Because, because here's the thing. You know, and, and look, I love Anna on, on TYT. You know, me and me and me and Jake are really good friends. Uh, and Anna's a phenomenal person. But once again, when you're talking about pro progressives, a lot of them, it's either all or nothing. It's either 100 percent. This is the way or we don't want to play. And that's the problem is Tulsi is not 100 percent when it comes to progressives. She's 75 percent. And that's just not enough for them. <laughs> I think her and Yang would be a good combination as for next year, if they wanted to run, uh, that's 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 definitely <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Ted Cruz. <laughs> Ted Cruz is an absolute worm. Believe it or not, let me tell you something. Uh, let me, chicken shit. He's a chicken shit. Let me tell you this. And let me. And this is this is you people in Texas. If you ever ever reelect him, I lose all respect for Texas. Let me tell you something. Texas is one of them states. Everybody that serves in the military from Texas, they'll fight you in the street. They don't back down from nobody. But let me tell you something. Ted Cruz let Donald Trump call his wife ugly, and he didn't say shit. Let me tell you something. Every time Donald Trump gets within 10 feet of Ted Cruz, there should be fisticuffs. I don't give a shit. Called his wife ugly, that's an ass whooping coming. It is what it is. So he's a chicken shit. He also implied that uh, his Father murdered JFK. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. Ted Cruz is a weasel. He's a little worm. He's a chicken shit. He's not no Texan. I'll tell you that right now. I don't give a shit if he's from there. I don't give a shit if he was born there. He ain't no real Texan. <laughs> uh, last one, uh, Rudy Giuliani. Let me tell you something. Piece of shit. Let me tell you. Here is a man that when the towers fell, he was America's mayor. Everyone rallied around Rudy and Rudy did a great job. He really did. And he's thrown all of that in the garbage. He's a perv too. He's thrown it. He's thrown his legacy in the trash to bootlick Donald Trump. And everybody knows who watched that Borat film. Let me tell you something. I've been to numerous, numerous interviews in hotels Make no mistake about it. I've had to go and meet in the in the lobby of hotels and get interviewed all the time. Never once when we finished the interview did we adjourn to a bedroom, ever. Did we go to their room, period. And he just got up, went there, and then laid down. And look, I'm going to say it. He stuck his hand down his pants. If you watch, he was fluffing it up. He was trying to get, because he figured he was getting ready to have to pull it out and show it to this young lady. He was in there. He was fluffing it up with his hand. He, he was, I don't want her to laugh at it. So he was trying to, he was trying to shake it up, you know, that's what he was doing. And then all of a sudden, I wish, I wish to God 
that I think I think Borat, you know, he really screwed it up. He should have waited because I bet you if he had waited ten more seconds, Rudy would have pulled that shit out. <laughs> and then I wish you would because then because then, Rudy said, oh, I was just I was just tucking in my shirt. Bullshit. We know he wasn't. But, you know, 10 more seconds would have proven that for sure. I, I just wish he would have waited. Yeah. Borat said he was just doing that to keep her safe because he's like, I'm the director. I couldn't just let that go. So, no, I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> uh, and, and, and let me tell you something. Sasha Cohen is actually an amazing actor. And he is absolutely so, so intelligent. He really is. I mean, I, 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 I'm a, I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, but my goodness gracious, man. I mean, Rudy's a perv. Rudy's a perv. He's a perv. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming on and talking to me for a while. Um, I, when I first Facebook messaged you to like, I was passing through West Virginia, and I'm like, well, maybe he'll answer. I don't know. I didn't think you really would. But uh, I was like, hey, can I come visit for visit you if, uh, while I'm passing through West Virginia? Thought maybe like meet at a restaurant or something, say hey, something like that. Yeah. And uh, I was shocked when you were like, yeah, come over to my house and we'll and you know we come there and we talk for hours and your wife cooks dinner and like all this stuff. Like I was just like, wow, that's crazy. I was yeah. telling my my coworker about it. And she's like, she's like that is weird. She's like, she's like it. It's not weird. It shouldn't be weird. But she's like, most people wouldn't do that. That's look, look at the end of the day, you know, you allow me the opportunity to be able to, to, to share my voice. And I'm not always right. I'm not perfect. You know, to me, when we do things like this, I'm also waiting. If I say something that you disagree with for you to educate me, because maybe you can change my mind. But at the end of the day, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm no better than anybody else. You know, just because I have a voice that some people out there apparently think they like to hear, uh, you know, you 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 have your own podcast now and, you know, you are, you know, your podcast can grow. You know, I've been on, you know, who Stuttering John is. No. Stuttering John was a comedian on the Howard Stern show for years. Stuttering John has his own podcast now. I've been on his podcast five times in the last month and a half. And let me tell you something, Stuttering John, it's really John Melendez. <laughs> Check him out. Go find, type in the Stuttering John podcast and follow him. Type in Stuttering John Richard Ojeda. And usually you have to go to the middle of his podcast and then I come on. But we have phenomenal conversations. And you know what? At the end of the day, people watch that. And sometimes they take something away that is beneficial for them, that may change their mind on certain things, may convince them the importance of voting, you know, uh, tell them about issues that are going on that in many cases, a lot of people basically walk around with their heads in the sand and they don't realize that in Washington, D.C., things are going on that are hurting people. You know, you need to know that your politicians that you support, you need to know if they're members of ALEC. You know, A-L-E-C. These are things that people don't realize, but they need to know because those things are hurting our average citizens. You can't afford to pay for gas. Well, that's probably because you've got people that don't give a shit to allow big energy to just take and take and take. So these things are important. And I enjoy, you know, I'm getting ready to start my own podcast. And, you know, I, I want you to share my podcast. You know, I will tell you that when we're done with this, I want you to send me the link because I'm going to go let everybody know that I was on the the, the Taco Tuesday. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to say, hey, had a great conversation. Go check it out. Next thing you know, you've just gained a thousand uh, new followers on your podcast. Because at the end of the day, one of these days, if you continue doing this and you're successful, hell, you may get paid for your podcast. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. If you're providing a great resource to people and people enjoy what you say and people enjoy the people that you bring on your podcast, you may be able to get paid for that. And you know what? I hope you do. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. And I, that's going to be an awesome podcast. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm asking everybody here to basically follow me on Twitter. It's the Ojeda for America, my account. Go follow me on YouTube. 
Uh, it's the uh, uh, Saprify1993 at gmail.com or just type in Richard Ojeda. You should be able to see me there. On Facebook, uh, on Twitter and Facebook, I've got the blue check marks. So uh, I've got, you know, 83,000 followers on Facebook, 75,000 followers on Twitter. So go there, follow me. And uh, I do live videos almost every night and I enjoy it. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to spread my voice. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you.